Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful, wonderful to be in Phoenix. As I said, walking over this morning, I've been in climates that are freezing cold, but never climates that are A, as temperature warm and also warm in spirit. So thank you very, very much for welcoming me and for the terrific invitation. Uh, let's just see if our tech is set up. Yeah, great. Okay, I, I'm actually going to go back to the very first slide. Um, this talk probably looks a little strange to you, that I'm starting out with talking about light bulbs and pies and gears and stars, and you're probably saying, oh my goodness, this woman is going to drive me nuts. Well, hopefully that indeed will not be the case, but by the end of this talk, all of that I think will become clear, as well as how it relates together to make your very, very great state of Arizona even more fabulous than it is currently. Uh, I'd like to begin with a little story that relates to the stars. It appears that uh, one evening Galileo and Copernicus were on the top of a very, very big mountain. It was very, very dark. They were sleeping. And all of a sudden, Galileo woke up and he poked Copernicus and he said, Copernicus, Copernicus, look, what do you see? And Copernicus said, oh, the sky is majestic. I see the moons of Saturn. I see the rings of Venus. Aren't we lucky to be in our profession and really learning and studying up all of all this? And he said, Galileo, what do you see? And Galileo said, all that I see is that somebody stole our tent. Um, I share that story um, not only because it relates to stars, but also it is to say that we all have different perspectives on different things. They did on what happened, and I want to say that I'm delighted to share my perspectives on the following topics. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is a quick run through about what do we really know about early childhood, and that's kind of the light bulbs. The second thing is I want to talk a little bit about why some of the changes that we all are working so hard to make are tough. That's going to be depicted as a pie. Third, I want to talk a little bit about how we might think differently, the gears. And finally, I want to conclude with sort of reaching for the stars. What is it that is in our power to really do? So let's begin with the light bulbs. Um, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that the early years matter, they matter a lot. And they matter for a variety of different reasons. Not only is this the most formative and rapid period of development, but it is the period where what happens is sustained to children long into their living lives. The second thing we know about young children is that they really do learn differently from children who are, say, seven or eight. It's not an accident that every single learning theorist, whether you're talking about Froebel to Montessori, any of them, note that when children are about age seven or eight, something different happens. So let me give you an example. How many of you, um, either to your children or grandchildren, have read to children who are below age seven? probably everybody in this room, right? Almost everybody in this room. And you know that when you ask a young child, what do you want to read, invariably, they will pick the same book that they have read over and over again. How many of you have had that experience? Yes, indeed, it's just natural. If you ask an eight-year-old the same question, what can I read you, if they want you to read to them at all, they will pick out something that is completely different. And if you say, well, what about this one that you read before, because you've had experience working with very young children, they'll say, oh, no, I read that before. That's babyish. Why? Why do children below age seven or eight love repetition, children over it disparage it so? It's because learning is very, very different for young kids. They like repetition. They like engagement, and indeed, if we know that young children, we all think that children begin their learning here, and as they grow older, they learn more and more and more. If you know a little bit more about children, you know, well, they begin here, and they learn in steps. They plateau, and they learn, and they plateau, and they learn, and they plateau, right? Right? Really and truly, the way young children learn, and I'm talking about young children below age seven or eight, is that they learn and they forget and they learn and they forget and they learn and they forget and it goes in an onward spiral. That's why repetition is so important. That's why we seek so much to integrate our learning in early childhood. We also know that in, for young children there are five essential domains of learning that are simply not negotiable. 
that we could not possibly have a quality early childhood program that focuses on disciplines in the way that K-12 to does, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that we really need to respect physical development, social and emotional development, language and communication development, cognitive development, and of course, children's approaches toward learning. So young kids are different, they learn differently, and we've got to accommodate that. The next thing we know for sure is that high quality programs, note the use of the words high quality, produce important results and save society money. Uh, the rates of amount that are saved vary from $4 for every dollar invested to 17, you all know that research. The fourth thing we know is that we really do know how to produce high quality early childhood programs. You can debate all kinds of learning models, you can debate theories of reading, but in early childhood, we've got it down pat, and we've got a lot of research to back it up, and while there can be some room for accommodation, basically we understand the importance of class size, of teacher qualifications, of ratios, and of curriculum, and we also know that very important to our mission is the role of families and the honoring of diverse cultures of children. We know that early childhood education is experiencing unprecedented attention. Never before. People to hear mayors talk about early childhood the way your mayor did, to know that there are in movie theaters um, in things examining uh, the importance of early childhood is really quite amazing. And indeed, all you have to do if you are anywhere in America is pick up a newspaper, and this is from one week in May, of where early childhood got all its kinds of headlines. So what does this mean for us? It means that we have got a lot of responsibility to act very, very wisely now. Now is not the time to make mistakes because what we are doing, the policies, the programs that we are instantiating, not only are they important for very young children as they always have been, but they are important for the system of early childhood that we are leaving our legacies. It seems to me that as a field, and I am criticizing myself as well as um, many others, that we have not thought very, very deeply and very, very big and very, very visionary. We have focused a lot because we've been forced to on getting programs mounted, less on their quality. We have focused a lot on the programs themselves, not on systems. There are, of course, notable exceptions to this, and more importantly, there are very good reasons for our doing what we as a field have done. And so now I wanna go to part two, and I'm gonna move off of the light bulbs into the pie, and I'm gonna try and put in context why the field is where it is today as a prelude for where we might be going. So change is tough because we've got a long history and we've got long legacies. And I'm gonna discuss this in three ways. One is, what's the history of our country? And don't worry, it won't be long, you won't get bored. How does that frame the history of, East, of early childhood and what are the legacies that it has left? So let's begin with the history of the country. At its basic root, if you, and I get to travel all over the world in my route and I wouldn't trade America for any other country in the world, but we have got three fundamental values that shape who we are. The first is indeed the value of independence. And you all know that when um, founding fathers came to America, they put a lot of emphasis on the priority, the primacy, and the privacy of the family. And it was the government's job to intervene only when family, families failed or when there was a national crisis. So, lo and behold, we did have comprehensive early childhood policies in this country. In World War I, the war was over, it ended. The Great Depression, it was over, it, all the policies ended, and indeed, during World War II, we probably had the most comprehensive system of early childhood supports that existed anywhere in the world via the Lanham Act, and after World War II, with the exception of Texas and California, all of those efforts were depleted. We were in kind of a new period. The war on poverty left us important legacies. The Head Start legacy, which indeed has been luckily sustained through the hard work of Head Start parents and Head Start advocates. But the basic premise is that we intervene when 
the society needs us or when families fail. The second value, a value of localism. This country profoundly believes in local level control. And that is because we were designed to have local voices foster our democratic principles. And third, the value of entrepreneurialism. No country on earth values entrepreneurialism as much as America. We have very strong beliefs. Horatio Alger, if you try hard enough, you can lift yourself up by the bootstraps. Our streets are paved with gold. We understand that these are all myths, but nonetheless, they are part of our intellectual and historical ethos. So the legacy for the field, I talked about um, independence, that we intervene only when we think that we need to be involved in times of crisis. Anybody know what the very first policy was, government policy to protect children and families in this country? Anybody? So I can't hear you. Not the, well, actually, the Bill of Rights, we could get into a whole long discussion. The Bill of Rights does address children and families, but the actual policy was 1935, the Social Security Act, and what did it provide for? Orphans and children who could not care for themselves, bespeaking this trajectory of the government intervening when families could not manage themselves. The legacy of localism, we've got mixed funding streams in all of our communities. We've got public providers and private providers because in this country, the, it has never been seen as a government responsibility to provide comprehensive services. And indeed, entrepreneurialism, if we take a look, we've got a lot of our programs, actually the majority of early childhood programs function in the private sector, something that we don't acknowledge very, very often. Importantly, the legacies of all of these things. First, there is tremendous inequity in America in who has access to services. Second, there are great inconsistencies in quality. And third, there are tremendous inefficiencies in the way we use resources. This is the third slice of the pie, the bottom one, and I'm going to highlight each of these and give you a little bit of data to support this. So what about inequities in access? Nationally, we have tremendous inequities by race. Indeed, if you take a look of the 54% of children who were not enrolled in preschool in our country, the largest percentage are our Hispanic youngsters, 63%, 59% are Native American, 51% are African American, 51% are white, and 48% are Asian American. You can see of children who are not receiving services that a large percentage of them are minority youngsters. Indeed, in Arizona, and these are data from 2010 to 2012, 23% of, Amer of Arizona's Hispanic and Latino children participate in preschool compared to 41% of white children. What about income nationally? Huge disparities. Rich kids, very rich kids, and very, very poor kids in our country somehow have better access to services than middle and lower income families. In Arizona, about 55% of your children under the age of six are low income. 27% of them live in poverty. That's a large, large rate. And indeed, while Head Start is doing an amicable job and many of our programs are, we still have large percentages of very poor children who are not receiving services in this state. Inequities also exist by neighborhoods. Affluent neighborhoods tend to have more child care centers and early child facilities than less affluent neighborhoods. It's the way it is, sadly. Inequities exist by mother's education. Preschool participation rates, and these are national figures, as a percentage of mother's education, indicate that 87% of children of parents of college graduates understand the importance and are able to enroll their children in preschool 55% of high school dropouts. And while those numbers don't seem high, it is, it's a 32% difference. That makes a huge difference when you multiply times the number of children. Mother's employment status also affects who gets enrolled. Indeed, nationally, inequities exist by English proficiency and by immigrant status. I don't have to tell people in Arizona about this. You know it very well, and you know the reasons why this does happen. 
but it is true that 43% of the children of immigrants between the ages of three and five throughout our country are in parental care and do not have access to early education. Inequities exist in geographic area, and I bet some of us haven't really thought about that, but children in the Northeast have the highest rates of participation in early childhood. In the South, it is less. Actually, in the West, it is the lowest participation rates of all. Indeed, if you know, New Jersey and Connecticut have the highest participation rates. Nevada, Arizona, and North Dakota have the lowest rates of preschool participation throughout the country. What does all this say about inequity of access? It says it's really not a pretty picture. Individual programs may be doing a great job, but when we look globally across what is happening for children, we are the richest nation on the planet, we are the nation that produces the most research about young children, and we are the nation that boasts, as our national creed, a commitment to equity. But as far as young children is concerned, I think these data would compel you to join me in agreeing that we're not doing a very good job. Okay. Now, let's turn to quality. We all know that quality makes a very, very big difference. Gaps in quality are not equally distributed. Low SES children and minority children are more likely, and these are data, the sources are all at the bottom here, I'm not making any of this up, larger class sizes, less smooth than outreach to transitions to schools, and teachers who have less training, lower compensation, and less stability. We know that these characteristics make programs high quality, and the kids who benefit most from high quality are the kids who are poor and who need it. We also know that there are tremendous quality variances as a result of what is required of teachers. Teacher certification rates vary dramatically, as do the requirements for teacher certification. Fortunately, through our National Head Start program, we have a requirement that is indicated by 2013, now passed, and we actually have met this, that 50% of all Head Start teachers will have certifications. But let's look at this graph. On the top bar are family child care providers, a very important part of our field. Middle bar are center assistants, and the bottom bar are center teachers. You will note that the dark blue are individuals who have high school degrees or less. And that percentage is largest for family child care and decreases for center teachers. Inversely, individuals with college graduates, the lighter blue, increase when we are talking about center teachers. But even though that exists, 33% of children in America are in classrooms where their teachers have BA degrees. And sometimes those BAs are not even in early childhood. The regulations vary incredibly by state. The quality controls of what it takes a program to be licensed vary. We vary in our states in terms of how much monitoring takes place to assure quality. And we vary dramatically in who conducts the monitoring visits, what kind of training they have. But even with all of this, if you take a look across the country, as the NEAR, the National Institute for Early Education Research did, there are 10 standards for quality. And indeed, only five state programs met all of those. 15 states met eight of 10, which means that lots and lots of children are not in programs deemed potentially high quality. Where is Arizona? You met, and these are the latest rankings that have come out, theirs are based on 2013 data, you met five of the 10 quality rankings. Your maximum class size met it, your staff ratios, your site visits, your amount of time for in-service, which by the way is very, very low, not in the state, but as a criterion, and your uh, comprehensive early learning standards met the grid. I'm gonna go to this slide. Um, the areas where you didn't meet it are the ones that are not checked in the right-hand column. Your teacher specialized training, the requirements for teacher degrees, 
the screening um, and support that goes on for children and the provision of meals universally. What's the bottom line of all this on quality? Something isn't right. All this press about how important the early years are and everything we said we knew in the light bulb section of my presentation is not manifesting itself in terms of what this country is doing on behalf of children. The third issue that I want to point out that's a real big problem are inefficiencies in the way we administer programs. Um, it is no secret that the federal government as well as state governments have multiple programs, many of which are not at all coordinated. We, you may not realize this, but Head Start allocations vary very widely by state. And it's not just a per pupil formula. It's a very complicated formula. Um, you were allocated in Head Start money $121 million at last count. New Hampshire was allocated $15 million. That's quite a big disparity. There are population disparities. However, there are needs disparities as well. States vary in the degree to which they spend their TANF money, which is the money for welfare funds, which can be directed into early childhood. You spent 0%, according to my data, of your TANF funds on child care, compared to Massachusetts that spent 26% of its TANF funds on child care. You're allowed to spend 30%. You get the point that there is tremendous state variation in the way resources come into the state. There's also tremendous variation in the way states allocate resources. This, you don't have to understand this very clearly, but from this slide, just take away the jaggedness of those bars. Each line represents one state, and the, along the horizontal axis at the bottom are different ways that states can invest in young children. They can fund early childhood or preschool programs. They can have very good subsidies. They can have great tax provisions. They can support family leave, which is the lowest one right here. Nobody, virtually nobody does that. And they can generate their own revenue. The point of this slide is to say we're different in the money that comes in. We're different in the way we raise money to spend it. Let's look at Arizona. In Arizona, your total spending at pre-K was about $13 million. Your spending per child enrolled was $2,000 at the pre-K level. I would guarantee that your per child spending for K-12 education is considerably more than that. I live in the state of Connecticut, a very wealthy state. We spend about four years ago, we spent $8,700 per child. It's now up to about 11,000, but to make the point, 8,700 for children five years through 17, that was the average daily expenditure, not daily, annual expenditure. For children who were four years old, one year lower, we spent $87, 87 to $8,700. So $100 more, a percentage, 100% more on children who are five years old versus four years old. This bespeaks a tremendous inequity in the way we fund programs. The other legacies regarding inefficient administration are that our planning long term is really not very regulatable. Our revenue generation strategies are inconsistent. Our financing schemes tend to focus on the quantity of services, not their quality. The durability of state investments vary, and our decisions on funding are highly inconsistent and episodic, often based on the commitment of an individual leader. We still have got here today, gone tomorrow, investments in very young children. So the financing picture is not great. What about governance? Well, because there are so many different programs at the federal level that fund early childhood, we don't have a single entity that governs early childhood. Education has a single Department of Education in, all, in the federal government and in all the states. Health has a single department. It, we know where to go when there are issues. We know whom to lobby. We've got single, those entities have single committees in Congress. So we know how to lobby for more money. This doesn't happen in early childhood. We have 72 separate programs, and at the state level, we have equal variety. Moreover, we're constantly adding programs, so this is constantly changing. The bottom line is that early childhood is not K-12. Look at these issues. 
for governance, for pre-K, there is nothing formalized. It's a hodgepodge. Arizona has made important steps in this way. K to 12, every single state has a state board of education and every single state has local boards of education. There's an organizational structure. Finance, pre-K, chaotic, multiple funding streams, education K to 12 in this country, a guaranteed tax base. I was a school principal at one point in my life. I didn't worry about if I was gonna have money to open my center or my school the following year. I was a Head Start director also. And let me tell you, I did worry if I was gonna have Head Start funds being allocated through the Congress for the programs. We don't have durable financing. Professional certification in early childhood, none universally required throughout our country. However, for our teachers in K-12 education in America, BAs are virtually universally required plus additional training. You getting the picture? Our infrastructure that supports early childhood is that regulation. In early childhood, there is a base that is required Typically, to operate a program, you need very basic regulations. They're very, very minimal. Everything else is voluntary. State QRISs are voluntary, uh, quality rating systems, accreditation. K-12, to required accreditation. I think you get the point that we're working hard and we are making progress, but we are not doing this in a way that is solidifying the base that will allow these programs to be sustained, to be reasonably governed and financed with competent professionals across the board. My bottom line here on the pie is that it's not our fault. We are encased in a national history that breeds inequity and inconsistencies and inefficiencies. We've got a very big infrastructure that we have got to work within. The second is that our non-system in this country is unlike that of any of the countries with whom we routinely compete. It doesn't look this way in Finland. It doesn't look this way in Singapore. It's organized, it's durable, it's funded over time. There is an agency to go to. The third bottom line is what's going on in early childhood is not like what exists for elementary and secondary education in this country. You cannot think about preschool or early childhood programs as baby school systems. We look much more like higher education because in higher education, the market prevails. You choose what college you want to go to. You self-fund for the most part. That is still true in early childhood as opposed to K-12 education. So we need to really think hard about how to create a system that works for the context that is early childhood. So now that takes me to thinking differently and to thinking about gears. This is the third metaphor. Everybody with me, okay? Got it? I'm not hearing too much over here. You with me? Okay, gears, good, all right. Now, here is the way the legacy of America's history has led us to fund early childhood programs. We fund, think of them as flowers. We fund a patch of primary programs. We fund a patch of childcare. We fund a patch of Head Start. We fund a patch of pre-K and we fund a, fat, a patch of family childcare. This is how our funding comes to us. Now, in some cases, people have been a little bit innovative and they have really commingled funds in, a, in an appropriate way so that we've got some Head Start and child care mixes, et cetera. But essentially, it's done at the local level. It's not at the federal level. The money still comes down in these sort of funding streams. So let me ask you a question. When you garden and you plant a bunch of flowers, lots of programs, and you keep adding new ones to the soil, but you don't do anything to nurture the soil, what happens to those programs, to those flowers? They die, right? They die. It's just impossible to keep planting flowers, or what I'm asking you to ask is to keep creating these programs and expecting that they're going to be high quality when we are not addressing the soil. So let me go back here. So what is in the soil? these little gears, pardon the really bad metaphor of something natural above the soil and mechanistic, but I need to make the point. We need to really understand 
what is going to make those flowers bloom? What's going to keep them alive? And I want to suggest to you that there are seven things that we need to focus on if we want to build a system of early childhood education in America that will be durable, that will be of high quality, and that will be equitable. Two formulas I'd like you to remember that when I talk about a system, I really mean a formula. A system is nothing but all the programs, the flowers above the soil, and all of the infrastructure, the stuff beneath the soil that I'm going to be talking about. And the second one is 8 minus 1 equals 0, which says what? If you take away one gear, you've got nothing. The point is that all of them are important, so we can't have favorites. We've got to address the flowers, and by making them high quality, it will only happen if indeed we create the system and address the infrastructure. Why am I so passionate about this? I am because I have seen us for now, for me, about 45 years, putting a lot of energy into creating very, very good model or individual programs that are terrific and do a terrific job. Often they are not scalable. Often the quality of those programs dissipates when particular leadership leaves. My goal is to make sure that we have access for all children to high quality programs and that will not happen using the current strategies. We must begin to think systemically. That doesn't mean that you're not going to work on one of the gears or two of the gears because it's going to be hard to work on all eight of them at one time. But ultimately, we need a long-range plan that looks at all eight of the gears. So let me begin quickly and go through what they are. The first, and to me the most important gear, is family, community, and parent engagement. Unlike other countries, we are passionately committed to the engagement of parents in the lives of their young children in all dimensions whether it be what they do at home with their children or whether it be engaging them in the important decisions that are made about our programs. I want to accolade, I was a Head Start teacher and a Head Start director, and I really want to say that we uniquely in this country have a model of parent engagement and citizen engagement in our Head Start programs when it is done right. But that is the first gear and the one we need to remember. And I was so happy to see that you are outreaching to the community about the importance of early childhood. That's our base. That's our baseline. The second gear, let me go forward. The second gear I want to talk about is regulations and quality programs. Every single piece of research that we have, everyone says that the more stringent the regulations on the program, the higher the quality. We're in a very anti-regulatory period in our country, but that doesn't mean that regulations are not important. You and I wouldn't ride in an airplane if it were not well-regulated. We wouldn't step into an elevator if it didn't have one of those little certificates in the corner. And I'm suggesting to you that it's not bad to have really strong regulations that promote quality programs. What are they? You know them. They're programs where children are bathed in language, where children are actively engaged, where cues about curriculum and what children learn are taken from the children, where children are able to pursue inquiry and reflection and curiosity. And by the way, when all this is in place, there is no question that we will and are producing good outcomes for children. We've got a lot of different ways to improve quality in our country right now. Regulation, quality rating and improvement systems, and accreditation, and they are all really, really important. Um, I mentioned the floor that regulations provide. In no way are they sufficient. Quality rating and improvement systems do a remarkable job, a remarkable job, and I encourage um, every state and actually every country that I'm in to really examine these. There are hard questions with QRIS. QRISs are not easy to mount, um, but we have to figure out if they will be mandatory or voluntary. Will they exist in one portion of the state or for certain programs only child care and not all other programs? How will they be funded? Nonetheless, you get the idea. We've got the intellectual tools and capacity to really mount high quality programs. 
Needless to say, accreditation is another process where programs voluntarily engage in self-study. Their work is reviewed by a team of commissioners, and indeed, they become the gold standard, the NAYC accreditation being, of course, um, the one that is most notable. You get the point. Quality matters, and we've got the tools to do it. Okay, next gear, professional development. The quality of any institution, whether it's a child care center, a great university, the largest Fortune 500 companies, the people who are donating funds to support you, their quality is based on the quality of the personnel. We don't have a single standard. We're not even sure if we think a BA is necessary. There's a lot of debate in the field about that. We also have a very rampant turnover of personnel, so it means that a lot of money that you invest in in-service training gets lost because those people end up leaving the field. For my money, the investment in these first three years is absolutely critical, engaging families, engaging efforts for quality programs, and making sure that our personnel are very high quality. We've got lots of different examples throughout our country about how to go about this. There are some, and the majority, as expressed by the large blue area, are targeted for programs that focus on one major issue. Um, level two are programs that are integrated. They focus on more than one issue. Level three are comprehensive issues. By a level two program, I mean if you go to training, we will reimburse your in-service training, we will give you a bonus. That's kind of a level two integrated. Level three on this chart, let me go back. Level three comprehensive would be something like the TEACH program that really does provision for all sorts of engagement. The point of this is that we've got models to work on professional development, and indeed we need to do that. The fourth gear are standards and assessment. Um, in my mind, this is actually the most confused domain and the one where there is a tremendous amount of debate. There's confusion about standards. There are standards for programs, there are standards for teachers, and there are early learning and development standards that specify what young children should know and be able to do. Arizona, as measured by NEAR, really does have a wonderful, wonderful set of standards. The question that we are now all engaged in is what about testing and assessment? A lot of people early on did not want us to have any standards because they were afraid that it would lead to very, very, very high stakes testing. It becomes a very controversial domain. We now have three major consortium that are developing excellent assessments for young children. And I think we're going to see a new, more benign, and more controlled approach to the assessment of young children. This slide bespeaks the different kinds of standards that exist. It says that at the heart of all of these are the early learning and development standards. And the theory is that if you have really good early learning and development standards, your standards for what teachers should know and be able to do should come back right to that heart, those early learning standards, what programs should be doing, et cetera. Early learning and development standards are the heart. And most high quality sets of early learning standards address the five domains of development. Moreover, and actually countries around the world are doing a much better job of using their standards. America has got gorgeous standards that are sitting on shelves. We have not validated them in any single state. Every other country that I work with has. And in every other country, they are using them to help improve instruction, to actually as the basis for, Romania uses them as a basis for all their parenting education programs. China has developed its entire curriculum for children based off of its standards. The public information efforts that are taking place in Africa are all based on the standards. That meaning that everybody will be on the same page regarding what is appropriate to expect from very, very young children. Okay, governance. As I noted, every functioning organization must have a clear approach to governance. I don't care if you're a child care center or if you're the, America, the European Union. They provide visibility to efforts. They enable us to coordinate amongst services and structures, very important in early childhood given our history. They are able to influence direction. And indeed, there are characteristics of governance entities. Many people say, oh, we're setting up a council, or we're setting up a this or a that. 
A governance entity is only a governance entity according to the political science literature when it has three characteristics. It is strongly accountable for something, it has authority for making decisions over the rules, and it is durable, it lasts over time. It won't be gone away tomorrow. Fortunately, in Arizona, with first things first, you indeed really do have a wonderful structure that is, I want to say, and I want to congratulate you, that I use as a case example of a state that is doing a wonderful job in coordinating and in prioritizing early childhood. So, <laughs> if I were creating the 10 criteria for quality early childhood systems, these would be, each of the gears would be one of the quality criteria, I actually should do that, one of the quality criteria, and Arizona on governance would rate clearly number one. <laughs> so, hooray. Financing. Um, I think we as a field need to accept the reality that we're never gonna have one single financing mechanism, and we need to think about important ways to link these various financing gears together. There are lots of different strategies that are being used to generate new revenues, taxing strategies, conditional cash transfers are used almost exclusively in Latin America, social impact bonds are being used in some Western European countries and are gaining currency here, and indeed we have some sustainable financing models where some people are even saying, let's eliminate grade 12 because kids don't do much and put that money into early childhood. I cite that as an example, not because I agree with all of these approaches, but simply because we are and we do need to think inventively about how we are going to finance this thing durably. Um, linkages to K-12 and other services. I want to indicate that I have a profound respect for America's commitment to public education. We need to understand that this is one of the strong points of our country one of the reasons why people want to bring their children here. We see it from the inside, we see its strengths, and we see its weaknesses. But under no condition should we indeed disparage what is going on in K-12 education. Rather, we need to find ways to link with it in ways that are meaningful and in ways that propel an early childhood ideology far more greatly into the primary years. It's one of the reasons we tend to think of transition efforts as being important for children and their families to ease them as they make the hump, but it's also important because indeed we need to do a little bit of a reset on the nature of primary education in this country, and fortunately we've got a lot of people who are working very, very, very hard at it. Um, we've advanced a model about how to go about doing that that says you can't just have Band-Aid activities. It's not about inviting kids into the kindergarten classroom, it's got to be more profound. It's got to be continuity in curriculum, continuity in standards. There's got to be alignment of program and alignment of policies. I'm running a little bit late on time, but I'm going to just skip this. And finally, I want to say that the last year is data systems. Um, in the countries that we routinely compete with, if you ask them what are the elements of their infrastructure, they begin with an integrated data system that collects data on all children throughout the state, irrespective of their program that they are in at early childhood or whether or not they are in a program. We in America have two data points, when kids leave the hospital and when they turn five and when they enter schools. We do not have in any state of the union a fully integrated database that is enabling us to make wise programmatic and policy decisions about young children. Fortunately, the data quality campaign in Washington has laid out 10 goals in terms of what characterizes a really good data system. So we've got that work done for us in terms of conceptually how to go about doing it. I want to make two points clear about the gears before I move to the stars. The gears are one way to think about building an early childhood infrastructure. They're important. You may not accept all of them, you may not be able to work on all of them simultaneously, but the message is that we will never get quality flowers unless we have attention focused on the gears. It is simply impossible to get programs at scale unless we have this infrastructure. Okay, moving to the stars last, I wanna say there are three things. This is simple that we as the stars of early childhood need to do. Focus, plan, and reach. Focus. 
The first focus is we have got to make sure that every single politician who funds our programs know that the focus on the quantity of programs is insufficient. We need sufficient funding to make the programs high quality because if we don't fund high quality programs, we're not going to achieve the ends that they think they are buying. And many of us are very, very worried about what happens when the reality of these low quality programs comes to haunt us. We've based much of our funding on the fact that we can produce results, but it needs to be high quality to do that. There is no study that has been done on this continent or any other that shows that we get positive impact from mediocre or low quality programs. Every shred of data is predicated on high quality programs and right now as a country we don't have the capacity to do that. The second issue to remember is that we've got to focus on the systems, not just on the programs. If you walk away from this conversation, please know that I am not at all against spending money on individual programs, but to sustain it, you need to focus on the gears. The third issue to remember for focus is that many, many states are focusing on one age, notably four-year-old children, because it's the age most close to preschool. The reality is, is that every shred of data we have says, yes, that's important, but it's very important to focus on children below age three as well. We should not be discriminating the nature and the quality of services we provide predicated on the ages of the children. Focus. I think it is critically important to focus on governance and finance, and you in Arizona are well positioned because you have got that platform. Then I think focusing on professional development so we can sustain a quality workforce over time and pay a quality workforce what they are deserved to be paid, and then getting our standards right, which indeed we need to do. So Arizona has moved quite far forward on this. We need to plan well. We need to be operationally realistic for Arizona. We're not going to get it all done at once, but that doesn't prohibit us from visioning the ideal. So you vision the ideal, you create what it is you want, and then you strategize for what is reality. We build long-term plans and we review them. And finally, the third thing we need to do is reach. We should not undersell, A, the momentum of our time, and B, our collective capacity to create an agenda that focuses not only on the programs, but on the infrastructure. Presented in this way, policymakers get it. If they want to invest, they want to invest for results, and that's the gambit indeed that we should be walking. We should shoot for the highest star, which you in Arizona have done dramatically. So I'm going to leave you with that, and I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but I thank you. You've been extremely attentive, and I hope now the gears and the stars and the flowers are clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.